But this also means that whenever any object changes its velocity due to some external force, it has to rotate due to relativity. Hello and welcome back to the 10th episode of my online course on special relativity. My name is Andrzej Dragan. I'm a professor of theoretical physics at University of Warsaw and National University of Singapore. And today we are facing a challenge. We will have to deal with a problem that looks trivial, but in fact is the hardest problem in special relativity. And in order to solve it, we will have to deal with quite a surprise. <laughs> So far we have only considered frames of reference that are in relative motion along the common x-axis. And such a one-dimensional motion is characterized by the standard Lorentz transformation formulas. What we would like to do now is to consider a motion that takes place in some arbitrary direction, not necessarily along the x-axis. And as we know, Lorentz transformation acts differently along the direction of motion and differently at the direction perpendicular to the velocity. So the transformation formulas for the spatial component parallel to the velocity are just a straightforward modification of our formula for x prime. And in this case, r parallel, which is a spatial component parallel to the direction of motion, is just proportional to the scalar product of r times v. So that the equivalent of the transformation formulas for x prime can be written in the following form. On the other hand, the spatial component that is perpendicular to velocity, does not transform at all. The transformation formulas are trivial. And this can be expressed by saying that perpendicular component is simply the difference between the full vector r and the parallel component. And when we add up these two formulas, on the left-hand side, we get the full vector r in the prime frame of reference, and the right-hand side has its Lorentz transformed version, but in a full three-dimensional case. The temporal component of the Lorentz transformation is even easier to write. And all you have to do is just replace v times x with a scalar product between the vector v in an arbitrary direction and r. So this is a three-dimensional version of Lorentz transformations for an arbitrary direction of velocity of the moving observer. And similarly, we can also find the transformation formula for the velocity in a general three-dimensional case by simply taking derivative of the vector r prime over t prime. And the result is given by this slightly scary formula, which simplifies a lot in the non-relativistic limit when the velocities are much smaller than c. And now we are ready to discuss a kinematical problem that looks simple, but turns out to be quite tough to solve. In fact, it turns out to be the hardest problem in relativistic kinematics. And what is even more surprising is that people became aware of the complications that make this problem so annoying more than 20 years after the discovery of special relativity. And even Albert Einstein himself was surprised by the aspect of relativity we are about to discover. Mm -hmm. So our simple problem goes like this. Imagine two inertial observers, Alice and Bob, that observe the same witch. And according to Alice, the witch is flying at some constant velocity v, while for Bob, the same witch flies with velocity v prime. These are both vectors. And the question is, what is the relative velocity between Alice and Bob? That's it. This is the most difficult problem in relativity. So it looks trivial, and the solution for the non-relativistic case is trivial, because the answer is simply v minus v prime. But let's not get scared too easily. And let us try to solve this problem using our three-dimensional velocity transformation formula. First, let us notice that if the witch is moving relative to Alice with velocity v, then Alice has to move relative to the witch with velocity minus v. And similarly, if the witch is moving relative to Bob with velocity v prime, then Bob has to move with velocity minus v prime relative to the witch. And likewise, since Bob is moving with some unknown velocity v relative to Alice, then Alice has to move with velocity minus v relative to Bob. And we can use these simple observations 
to find the unknown velocity v by using our velocity transformation formulas with interchanged velocities. So instead of making a transition from the Alice's frame to Bob's frame, let us introduce the frame of the witch and make a transition from that frame to the frame of Alice. And when we do that, we will have to replace in our formula the small velocity v with the velocity minus v prime. Similarly, we will have to replace v prime with the capital V. And the role of the mutual velocity of the frames capital V is now played by small minus v, which is the velocity of Alice relative to the witch. If you make all these substitutions in our complicated velocity transformation formula, we will get the following result that directly shows us what is the capital V, the relative velocity between Bob and Alice. So let's have a look at the result. Because, after all, there is one property that should characterize that result, and namely, the relative velocity capital V should be a antisymmetric function of small v and small v prime. After all, we can always switch over Alice and Bob, and the relative velocity should simply change the sign. But looking at the complicated result, doesn't obviously show that it's an antisymmetric function of v prime and v. And we can make sure of that by considering a special case when those small v and small v prime velocities are simply orthogonal to each other, which means that their scalar product has to be equal to zero. And in that case, our expression simplifies greatly, and the outcome is given by the following simple formula. And clearly, it is not a antisymmetric function of small v and small v prime. So our result must be wrong. The correct result is much more complicated, and it takes way more effort to obtain it. Although in the further episodes I will show you how to obtain this result in just a few lines. But for now let's try to focus and find out what type of mistake we have made. This mistake is an important one. It is not just an error in calculations. And realizing what exactly we did wrong will help us uncover the very complication that I mentioned before, that took physicists more than 20 years to discover. So previously we have assumed that if the witch is moving with velocity v relative to Alice, then Alice must be moving with velocity minus v relative to the witch. And this statement is not necessarily correct. Because it turns out that the frame of the witch is rotated relative to the frame of Alice. And this unintuitive property is a consequence of the fact that a composition of two Lorentz transformations is not just another Lorentz transformation, but that there is an extra rotation involved. And indeed, if these two frames of reference are mutually rotated, then it is not true that if the witch is moving with velocity v relative to Alice, then Alice must be moving with velocity minus v relative to the witch. The actual velocity of the frame of Alice is a rotated minus v. So let us try to investigate how is it possible that these two frames of reference are indeed mutually rotated. So let us consider a special case when the frame of Alice is moving to the left relative to the frame of Bob so that they are moving along the common x-axis. And let us assume that the frame of the witch is moving vertically, so along the y-axis, relative to Bob. So in this setting, we can assume that in the frame of Bob, there exists a single instant at which all of the three frames of reference overlap, which means that all of the horizontal axes overlap and all of the vertical axes overlap at the same moment. This means that we can draw three red dots on three horizontal axes of the three frames. And these three dots will overlap at a single instant. And if you draw next to them three yellow dots on these three axes, they will also overlap at the same moment of time. And now let us ask a question. What happens in the frame of reference associated with Alice? Because of the relativity of simultaneity, the simultaneous overlaps of the red dots and the yellow dots 
in Bob's frame of reference will not be simultaneous anymore in Alice's frame, simply because she's moving along the horizontal direction. However, the overlap between the vertical axes will still be simultaneous in her frame of reference, because that perpendicular direction is not affected by Lorentz transformation. And the way to understand how is it possible is by realizing that in the Alice's frame of reference, the axis of the moving frame of the witch have to be tilted so that the vertical axis is still vertical, but the horizontal axis is not horizontal anymore. It is now rotated. And this leads to a problem. Because if the witch was just moving relative to Alice at some angle, then the Lorentz contraction should cause both of her axes to spread. And in our picture, only one of the axes is tilted. So we have a clear discrepancy between the two versions of the story. And apparently the reference frame of the witch is not just moving at an angle. It also must be rotated by some cursed angle. And that angle was the source of all the complications in our simple kinematical problem. And this is why it takes much more effort to compute the relative velocity between Alice and Bob. So a composition of two Lorentz transformations is not just another Lorentz transformation. It is a Lorentz transformation composed with an extra rotation. And it was that rotation that messed up with us and our simple kinematical problem. But this also means that whenever any object changes its velocity due to some external force, it has to rotate due to relativity. This geometric rotation is called Thomas precession. And we will study it in full detail in the next episode. But now I'm going to make some geometric turns due to change of my velocity.